I, Woodrow Wilson. I, Warren Harding. I, Calvin Coolidge. I, Herbert Clark Hoover. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will face... Five men sat in the White House between 1919 and 1933. Two were great, two were average, and one was a bad president. And the greatest of these was the most hated. The fact that he was also for a time the most beloved man on earth made the tragedy of Thomas Woodrow Wilson even greater. The world must be made safe for democracy. And when Wilson went to Europe the first time, the world's heartbeat was with him. In France, they lighted candles in his honor. He was cheered as no conqueror ever was. In Rome, his picture hung in almost every home. His was a glory far exceeding Caesar's. In England, his path from the Channel Coast to Charing Cross Station was strewn with flowers. This, indeed, was a man of peace. But less than a year later, the man of peace was a mere man of politics. He had made two trips to Europe and spent six months at that green bays table with Clemenceau, Orlando, and Lloyd George. He had laid his 14 points containing his league before them. And to keep his dream alive had been forced to compromise and conciliate barter and bargain to such an extent that the product he brought home for approval was already suffering from the anemia, which was the old world's chronic disease. Gentlemen of the Senate, the Treaty of Peace with Germany was signed at Versailles on the 28th of June. <coughs> I avail myself of the earliest possible opportunity to lay the treaty before you for ratification. My brothers, the stage is set. The destiny disclosed. We cannot turn back. America shall, in truth, show the way. He had been back less than 30 days when he realized that he was losing his battle, that his moment was slipping away from him. Although a majority of the American voters and most newspapers favored the League, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge had marshaled sufficient forces of jingoism to kill it. So, for the first time in a non-election year, an American president boarded a train and took his fight to the people. I have not come here to debate this treaty. It speaks for itself, if you will let it. I am going to expound it, to urge you here in Columbus to assert the spirit of the American people in support of it. Do not let men pull it down. And the opposition followed him across the country. Senator William Bora in Chicago. It took George Washington seven years to gain independence from George III. And now, my friends, they want to give it back to George V. The president made as many as five and six speeches a day. But he was smiling less now. I can predict with absolute certainty that within another generation there will be another world war if the nations of the world do not concert this method by which to prevent it. The crowd roared, impeach Wilson, as Hiram Johnson shouted, He is asking us to hand American destiny over to the secret councils of Europe it is the duty of the senators of this nation to keep America American. Wilson was picking up momentum. He had whipped Johnson in his own California. In Salt Lake City, his ovation was thunderous. On September 25th, he made his 40th speech in 22 days. It was his best one, and it was his last. Again and again, my fellow citizens, Mothers who have lost their sons in France have come to me and taken my hand and said, God bless you, Mr. President. 
I advise the Congress of the United States to create the situation that led to the death of their son. Why, my fellow citizens, should they pray God to bless me? Because they believe that their boys died for something that vastly transcends any of the immediate and palpable objects of the war. They believe, they believe they believe. The address had been given at the fairgrounds in Pueblo, but that night the president left without visiting the livestock exhibition. He boarded the train for Wichita, but the presidential limited never stopped in Kansas. With shades drawn, halting only to change engines, it hurtled on to Washington. There, a few days later, he suffered an apoplectic stroke. Now he was dying. On March 19th, the Senate dealt the treaty and the League the final death blow. The vote was 15 short of the needed two-thirds majority, with many Wilson supporters voting against the watered-down version. The nation was almost without a president now. The gates of the White House remained closed, the windows dark. The customary flow of visitors dwindled to an occasional pilgrimage by an old friend. His kingdom, his power, and his glory were gone. Perhaps William Allen White put it best. With calumny rampant around him, he tasted the ingratitude of his republic, the statesman's ancient cup of hemlock. No wonder that on the high and empty altar, where the flame of his fame was quenched, and the cold charred ashes were strewn, he lay helpless while the high priests of the temple cut out his heart. By 1920, Americans had lost one freedom and gained another. By virtue of the 18th and 19th Amendments, it was just as illegal to take a drink as it was to prevent a woman from voting. It was the year after the infamous Black Sox scandal, and it was the big year for Babe Ruth, Man of War, and the Manassas Mauler, of the Wall Street bombing and Main Street. Women's skirts were six inches above the ground and going up. So was the cost of living and Republican hopes. And 1920 was the year of the shrewdest prediction in the history of U.S. politics. Mr. Doherty, you don't really think Harding has a chance, do you? Well, boys, I'll tell you what I think. The convention will be deadlocked. After the other candidates have failed, we'll get together in some hotel room, oh, about 2.11 in the morning, and some 15 men bleary-eyed, with lack of sleep, will sit down around a big table. When that time comes, Senator Harding will be selected. That was the voice of Harry Doherty, who promoted the Harding boom almost from obscurity, and whose uncanny prediction was only 11 minutes off. An exuberant GOP had gone to Chicago to nominate the next president, but by the end of five hectic ballots, no one candidate commanded a majority. The tabulation of the vote for the nomination as President of the United States, Governor Loudon, 289 votes, General Leonard Wood, 314, Senator Hiram Johnson, 190. Then the convention adjourned, the party elders convening in that smoke-filled room, this was the moment for Doherty to trot out his dark horse. So it was that some 30 seconds after 2 a.m., Warren Harding was summoned, and 10 hours later, an excited convention gave him the nomination. Harding, who never considered himself presidential timber, accepted his party's call with the modesty and apprehension of a bewildered gambler, slightly out of his class, who had won the big hand. Well, gentlemen, as we say, I guess we just drew to a pair of deuces and, and filled. Extremely handsome and gregarious, Harding was a symbol of the times. The nation was war-weary and disillusioned. 
People wanted to loosen their belts and bask in the sunshine of prosperity. This was the time to live high, wide, and handsome, and Harding was the man to lead them. America's present need is not heroics, but healing. Not nostrums, but normalcy. Not revolution, but restoration. Not experiment, but equipoise. Not submergence in internationality, but sustainment in triumphant national. In just one moment now, KDKA, in cooperation with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun, will present the latest presidential election return. November 2nd, 1920. The first big news story into American homes by way of the earphones, the cat's whisker, and the crystal set. I can hear it now. It is now apparent that the Republican ticket of Harding and Coolidge is running well ahead of Cox and Roosevelt. At the present time, Harding has collected more than 16 million votes against some 9 million for the Democrats. We'll give you the state vote in just a moment. But first, we'd like to ask you to let us know if this broadcast is reaching you. Please drop us a card, address station KDKA, Westinghouse, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The first two years of the Harding administration were filled with harmony, happiness, and high wages, which a buyer's strike finally forced down. The self-starter was still part of the brave new world, and the unpredictable crank was still reaping its harvest of broken arms. The Maxwell, the Jordan, the Moon, the Pierce Arrow, and the open touring car were vanishing as quickly as the petticoat. It was definitely the age of the fliver and the flapper. Zigfield, Flo, you not only glorified the American girl, but you put enough clothes on her to make people want to see her. It was just about this time that a fellow twirling a rope who had stepped off an Oklahoma ranch and into the Ziegfeld Follies stepped onto the pages of the New York Times, which said, Not unworthily is Will Rogers carrying on the tradition of Aristophanes. Had there been no Ziegfeld and no Follies, I would today have been 12 miles north of Clarem, Oklahoma, plowing for corn, slopping the hogs, running my own still, and knocking the Republican Party as that is considered one of the chores in my country. I used to whine a song called Casey Jones with one hand and he used to spin the rope with the other and then whine into the old empty ring barrel with the other and then in between the verses I used to tell jokes about the Senate of the United States. If I needed any new jokes that night I used to just get the late afternoon papers and read what uh, Congress had done that day and the audience would die laughing. I wasn't old enough then to know what they were laughing at, but now that I'm a taxpayer, I know exactly what they were laughing at then. The White House is a kind of alchemist. There, little men have grown great, and great men have become giants. Warren Harding entered armed with the love and devotion of an adoring public. But the White House took this mediocre man, found his weaknesses, overwhelmed him, and broke him. His ordeal, which lasted 27 months, transformed a full-throated optimist into a faltering cynic. Listen to the process as it took place. Harding, just before his inauguration. I like to go out to the country and bloviate. What is the greatest thing in life? Happiness. And there is more happiness in the American village than any place on earth. The president, six months later. You know... Before I was elected, I thought the chief pleasure of being president would be to give honors and office to my old friends. But you know, you can't do that when you are president. You have to get the best man. Harding, after one year. The White House is a prison. I can't get away from men who dog my footsteps. I'm in jail. Harding, after 18 months. I am a man of limited talents from a small town. I, I don't seem to grasp the fact that I'm president. After 26 months. In this job, I'm not worried about my enemies. It's my friends who are giving me trouble. On July 24th, 1923, the late afternoon paper showed that Rogers Hornsby was leading the National League with 399 and that Anaconda Copper had closed at 42 and a quarter. 
The president was resting comfortably at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco after an attack of indigestion. And Calvin Coolidge, in the most anonymous job in the world, was fishing in Vermont. At 7.30, Harding's secretary, George Christian, was standing before a large audience in Los Angeles, reading the speech the president had been scheduled to make that night. <clears throat> the president continues. I am a confirmed optimist as to the growth of the spirit of brotherhood. We do rise to heights at times when we look for the good rather than the evil in others. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you must excuse uh, President Harding. The president is dead. In the East, the radio stations and theaters had been closed down for hours. As the bell of the Congregational Church in Plymouth, Vermont, tolls the hour, an oil lamp flickers on in the small white cottage of John Coolidge, a justice of the peace. While most of the nation sleeps, eight people witness the inauguration of the 28th president. Raise your right hand. <coughs> Do you, Calvin Coolidge, solemnly swear I, Calvin Coolidge, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute <coughs> the We awoke the next morning to read the, the black States. headlines and, and plunge into national grief. Bishop Manning of New York seemed to speak for the nation. Our beloved President is dead. If I could write one sentence upon his monument, it would be this. He taught us the power of brotherliness. May God ever give to us leaders as faithful, as wise, as noble in spirit as the one whom we now mourn. But slowly the wheels of our democracy began to reveal what Harding had discovered in his last two months in office. This committee intends to pursue further the story of Teapot Dome. In his desire to be loved, Harding had experimented in government by friendship. And his friends had robbed him of his name and destroyed all will except the one to die. Listen now to Senator Thomas Walsh of Montana as he plotted his way through the polluted oil of the Teapot Dome scandal. Mr. Fall, your reason for not calling for bids on these oil fields was what? Uh, business, purely. I knew I could get a better price without calling for bids. That's Albert B. Fall. Harding liked him for his stories about the Southwest, wanted to appoint him to the Supreme Court. Mr. Fall, what about your relations with Mr. Sinclair and Mr. Doheny? Did you ever receive any compensation for the oil leases at Teapot Dome or Elks Hill? I never suggested any compensation, and I received none. And what about your new ranch in New Mexico and the $100,000? The gentleman from whom I obtained it was the Honorable Edward B. McLean of Washington, and it was a loan. I never approached E.L. Doheny or H.F. <clears throat> Sinclair. But Senator Walsh plodded on. After months of questioning, he got McLean to admit that the $100,000 did not come from him. The climax of the investigation came when oil man Doheny, who made millions out of the lease, returned to testify. I regret that when I was before your committee before, I did not tell you what I am now telling you. I wish to inform the committee that on the 30th day of November, 1921, I loaned to Albert B. Fall $100,000 to purchase a ranch in New Mexico. How did you transmit the money to him? Remember, you're under oath. In a satchel. Who acted as messenger? <clears throat> My son. Mr. Doheny, you're a man of large affairs and big business transactions. Was a satchel not an extraordinary way of remitting money to Mr. Fall? I have remitted more than a million dollars in that way in the last five years. 
You must realize, Senator, that the amount of money I was loaning my old friend was no more than 25 or $50 to the average man. And you don't think there was any impropriety in loaning money to an officer of the government with whom you'd had large business transactions? No, there is Mr. nothing. Mr. Doheny, let's Just a get minute, to the point. Senator. There is nothing extraordinary about me. I am just an ordinary, old time, impulsive, irresponsible, improvident sort of a prospect. Fall's final appearance before the committee was that of a tottering, pitiful old man, unable to look his former Senate colleague in the eye. I decline. A lot of On advice of counsel to answer any more questions on the ground that it may incriminate me. Fall went to the penitentiary eventually. Sinclair served two sentences for contempt of court. Doheny was indicted, but eventually acquitted. Doherty, the attorney general, resigned, stood trial, and thanks to two hung juries, was technically acquitted. Charles Forbes, Harding's court jester in charge of veterans' affairs, went to Leavenworth after squandering $200 million of the taxpayers' money. Such was the legacy that Harding passed on to Calvin Coolidge. Fortunately for the nation, Charles Evans Hughes and Herbert Hoover agreed to stay on in the cabinet. Alabama has 24 votes for Oscar W. Underwood. By 1924, there were two and a half million radio sets, and that summer, Americans heard their first political conventions. A chaotic Democratic convention at Madison Square Garden droned on for 10 days and 103 ballots. Alabama Underwood, whose name became a nostalgic milestone, was never in the running. L. Smith and William Gibbs McAdoo, the favorites, so exhausted themselves and their supporters over the issues of prohibition in the church that when the 103rd ballot gave the nomination to John W. Davis, the party was ruptured and exhausted. Calvin Coolidge slaughtered them at the polls in November. My fellow countrymen, the business of America is business. And business was good in America. Coolidge, beginning his first full term in office, was the undisputed high priest of prosperity. He was calm, cool, and silent. The people were hot, hyperthyroid, and roaring. Legion, Legion, yes, we are Legion. Skirts were now 20 inches above the ground, almost at the knee. Employment and stocks were still rising, but nowhere near the peak. It was 1925. The automobile was changing the face of the nation, and our voice was changing, too. Day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Bridge gave way to the Kue system, which gave way to Mahjong. East wind, one crack, three bend. Mahjong! Oh, oh I have... Which gave way to the crossword. Mug, I need a ten-letter word meaning to expedite. Last letter is E. Reach for a lucky instead of a sweet. Here they come again, the Clico Club Eskimos. <laughs> Blow some my way. Four out of five have it. Remember, your future is in Florida, the fair white goddess of states. The Charleston craze, the black bottom, the flapper, the raccoon coat, an entire lexicon of new words. Oh, yeah? Says you. Lousy, bathtub gin, Freud, Izzy and Moe, the million dollar baby, breach of promise, booze, bobbed hair, and the blues. A revolution in music. Gershwin, Berlin, Handy, Beiderbeck, Whiteman. And the golden age of sports. Here he is in the motion, there's the wind up. Here's the pitch, it's a slow curve low, and the babe swings. It's a long one, a long one going out toward right center. 
Stengler's backing up against the wall. He can't get it. It's in there. Another home run for the Bambino. So the Babe hits his second homer of the day. Outlined against the blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. That's Grantland Rice. In dramatic lore, they are known as famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. Their real names, however, are Stuldrea, Miller, Crowley, and Layden. They form the crest of the South Bend Cyclone. And in country stores and speakeasies, Americans argued about payment of the war debts. President Coolidge said, They hired the money, didn't they? Let them pay it. I don't propose to make merchandise out of American principles. But while the favor of America is not for sale, I am willing to make concessions for a chance to do a little profitable economic and moral rescuing. In June of 1925, Dayton, Tennessee, nestled in the foothills of the Cumberlands, was a sleepy, obscure little town of 5,000. But by mid-July, it was a gaudy midway of lemonade stands, souvenir hawkers, telegraph sending stations, and had swollen to three times its normal size. It all revolved about a new state law, which outlawed the teaching of evolution. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the state of Tennessee, that it shall be unlawful to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Scopes himself was quite secondary to the trial. A rather personable young school teacher, he purposely created the issue by lecturing to his class on evolution. The stage was set. Scopes was arrested, indicted, and brought to trial. Then to Dayton came the two real protagonists, to prosecute, elder statesman, three-time presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan. I am here to protect the word of God from the greatest atheist and agnostic in the United States. For the defense, the highly successful criminal lawyer, Clarence Darrow. If today you can take a thing like evolution and make it a crime to teach in the public schools, then at the next session you may ban books and newspapers. Soon you may set Catholic against Protestant, and then Protestant against Protestant. Bryan believed it was strictly a battle between religion and atheism. Darrow insisted it was a fight between a literal translation of the Bible and a common sense one. There were many supporters from all faiths on both sides. The climax occurred when the defense called Bryan himself to be a witness. Now, Mr. Bryan, let me ask you if you take the Bible literally. For example, do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? Yes, I believe that. But it was a fish, not a whale. Was this a, a mine run of fish or made specially for the purpose? I am not prepared to say. Well, do you think that the Lord purposefully made a fish big enough to swallow Jonah? I do. Well, one miracle is just as easy to believe as another. A God who can make a whale can make a man and make both do what he pleases. The tiny courtroom, bursting with the press and spectators, sweltered in the impartial heat. And finally the judge moved the trial out on the shaded lawn where Brian and Darrow, in shirt sleeves and galluses, continued their duel. Uh, Mr. Brian, do you believe literally the story of Eve? I do. And the story of the temptation of Eve by the serpent? Yes. And that God made the serpent crawl on his belly for eternity because of his participation in the temptation? That is my belief. And how, sir, do you suppose that the snake got along before that? Your Honor, may I say that the only reason Mr. Darrow has in being here is to slur at the Bible. I want the world to know that this man, who does not believe in a god, is trying to use a court in Tennessee... I object to that, Your Honor. ...to slur at I the Bible. I object to your statement. I'm examining you on your fool ideas that no intelligent Christian on earth believes. What is it, Jerry? Scopes was found guilty and fined $100, which the Baltimore Sun paid. 
It was a humiliating final hour for the great commoner. In less than a week, he died. Dempsey had fought them all. Willard, Furpo, Carpentier. Now in the ring of the sesquicentennial stadium in Philadelphia, Father Time and a master boxer named Tunney had caught up with the perfect fighting machine which was William Harrison Dempsey. As he stood there in the warm rain, his face battered, swollen, and purple, he met fame halfway and for the first time gave his followers something to love him for. Honey, I guess I just forgot to duck. A year later, Dempsey crawled into the ring for the return match with the new champion. It was Dempsey's last fight, Tex Records' biggest gate, and a million-dollar purse for Tunney. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. This is Graham McNamee speaking from NBC. Most people remember Graham McNamee's description of that famous seventh Dempsey's round. coming out there, leading up. He comes into Tunney with both hands. Uh-oh, doesn't do any depth. As they come out of the clinch, Tunney's right catches Dempsey on the face. And Tunney, Tunney shoots a hard left to Dempsey. Gene follows that up with more left to Jack's jaw. And Dempsey, Dempsey comes back with a hard right to Tunney's face. Gene felt that. Gene felt that, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, Dempsey comes on through with a terrific right. He's got Tunney against the ropes. There's another right landing on the champion's jaw. A barrage of left and right. And Tunney is down. Tunney's down. Dempsey's on, on the other side of him. The referee has not yet begun to count. He has not. Nine, five, six, seven. Dempsey's waiting for him. Eight. Tunney's, Tunney's up. Tunney's up on nine. The fight's continuing. Tunney's back in the way. He's backpedaling. He looks a little groggy. Dempsey's coming in, trying to get to him, but he's backpedaling. He tries a long nap. Dempsey, laugh. with victory only seconds away, neglected to go to a neutral corner. The referee, in delaying the count, gave Tunney four revitalizing seconds. Tunney managed to stay on his feet, wore his panting pursuer to a frazzle, outboxed him, and at the final bell remained the heavyweight champion of the world. At nine minutes before eight on the morning of May 20th at Roosevelt Field, New York, the small single engine on a gray-white monoplane coughed once, turned over, and its nine-foot propeller began its revolution, which, as every schoolboy knows, lasted for 33 hours and 29 minutes. Will Rogers' column of that day said... No attempt at humor today. An old, slim, bashful, smiling boy is somewhere out over the middle of the Atlantic. Every man that flies the ocean from now on will always be just an imitation of Lindbergh. Where were you on May 20th, 1927? If you lived in New York, you may well have been at the Sharky Maloney fight, where Joe Humphreys asked the crowd for one minute of silence for the youngster they called Slim. No matter where you were, you will probably remember for the rest of your life what you did and what you heard and how the newspapers looked as the spirit of St. Louis inched its way across the great circle route toward Paris. This is CHNS Halifax, Nova Scotia. The government wireless station at Cape Rave, Newfoundland reported that Lindbergh passed overhead at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The weather is reported as poor. This is WJZ New York, George Hicks reporting. As Saturday dawned over the vast Atlantic, the Lindbergh plane is unreported since passing Newfoundland early last night. This is station 2RN Dublin calling. The American flyer Lindbergh passed over Dingle Bay on the Irish coast at a low altitude at 1.30 this afternoon. Ici Radio Paris. Un bateau pêcheur près de Cherbourg vient de nous informer que l'aéroplane de Lindbergh est arrivé à la côte de France à 3 heures de distance de Paris. This is Lowell Thomas in New York. He made it. Charles A. Lindbergh, Lucky Lindy as they call him, landed at Le Bourget Airport, Paris at 5.24 this afternoon, thus becoming the first person to fly New York to Paris non-stop. At Le Bourget, crowds lifted the slender, shy Midwesterner on their shoulders. Americans heard the news and went wild. It was Armistice Day, New Year's Eve, and a World Series no-hitter all rolled into one combustible hour. In New York Harbor, every ship loaned its whistle to the celebration. 
In Boston, Des Moines and San Francisco fire engines joined the mass hysteria. In an era of cynicism, the world had a hero. The president sent a cruiser to bring him back, and most citizens thought it should have been a battleship. They made him a colonel, and just about every city in North and South America offered him their cities and their hearts. Officially, the highest honor in America is being received at the White House. In the 20s, however, Welcome Mat USA was located down at the narrow part of Manhattan, where on the steps of the city hall, a dapper fellow named Walker reigned supreme. Colonel Lindbergh, New York is yours. I don't give it to you. You want it. And one other thing. Before you leave New York, you will have to provide us with a new street cleaning department to clean up the mess. There were other heroes, and they all came to be greeted by Jimmy. Queen Marie, on behalf of the people of the city of New York, I welcome your majesty. And its chief executive enjoys a distinction that I never thought would be visited upon a New York boy like me. Bobby Jones, you are a greater golfer than I. As a matter of fact, you are the greatest golfer that ever lived. Gertrude Ederly, you are a living vindication of the floating bath around New York. We have already given you the freedom of the city, and now you can have the freedom of the North River and the East River, and we'll throw in the aquarium too. It has been said that New York wore Jimmy in its buttonhole, and when the flower lost its freshness and developed a slightly unpleasant odor, the city finally put him aside, knowing that in the long haul, the Walker memory would be preserved between the pages of an old book, as cherished as a rose from an old bow. Tonight, August 23rd, 1927, the longest death watch in journalistic history ended at Charlestown, Massachusetts. Sacco and Vanzetti were dead. On the night of the execution, there was near rioting on the streets outside the state prison. The jarring sound of patrolmen's clubs and horses' hooves echoed off the wet cobblestones as patrol wagons clanged and sirens sounded in the distance. And in the governor's mansion, and in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, in Paris and in London, people waited out the last seconds of the long ordeal of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus Sacco and Vanzetti. It had lasted more than seven years and had been enacted against the background of America during the Red Scare of the early 20s. There had been a payroll robbery in South Braintree, Massachusetts. Two guards were murdered. Two immigrants, Nicholas Sacco and Bartholomew Vanzetti, were arrested. Tried in Dedham, convicted largely by circumstantial evidence. There were many appeals, and a final review by a governor's committee, all upholding the sentence. Yet, defending this shoemaker and this fish peddler were some of the great minds and finest newspapers in the land, who held that they were feared as anarchists and radicals, but in an atmosphere of growing hysteria had been tried for murder. They claimed that Judge Thayer had prejudiced himself, that the evidence was fragmentary, the witnesses vague, that a couple of labor agitators had neither the physical nor professional equipment to commit a daring daytime robbery. Out of the trials came poems, journalistic essays, plays, and more than a score of textbooks. Yet, long after all the poetry and speeches, people would remember the disturbing eloquence of Bartholomew Vanzetti in this, his final statement. If it had not been for this thing, I might live out my life, talking at street corners to scorning men. I might have died unmarked, unknown, a failure. Now we are not a failure. Never in our full life can we hope to do such work for tolerance, for justice, for man's understanding of men, as now we do by accident. The taking of our lives, lives of a good shoemaker and a poor fish peddler, all. That last moment belonged to us. That agony is our triumph. 
Since that fateful morning of January 16, 1920, when the consumption of alcoholic beverages had become illegal, a new kind of institution had sprung up in the land. Hello, suckers! The speakeasy became an American habit and a billion-dollar industry. Because it was illegal to drink in public or anywhere, the citizenry of all ages entrenched themselves almost nightly in dark, dingy cellars where against a background of bad murals, pockmarked bouncers, and stale air, they forced the human body to swallow some of the most corrosive poison ever consumed by man or woman. Madam, I give you my word. That's genuine five-year scotch. Got it off the boat myself just this morning. Almost everybody drank the stuff. The classy joints ran theirs through the Coast Guard's meager defense lines. The dives got it from the alky cookers. The stuff simmered in grape pots in Grandpa's basement, in the boarded-up brewery down the street, and in 25,000 illegal stills. Best moonshine in Carolina. Made it myself. And, as always, there were new words and phrases for the new pastime. Noble experiment, Jersey lightning, hijacking, clip joint, red ink, needle beer, the rum runners, 12-mile limits, sawed-off shotguns, scoff laws. You're going for a ride. Protection. And... One of the vilest words in the American language. You see that fellow over there? That's Al Capone. Al Capone was a bull-necked, ruthless, loathsome, syphilitic man who became more powerful than the mayor of Chicago. By controlling the sources of Chicago's alcohol, Capone built an organization of racketeers which controlled the nightclubs and speakeasies where it was drunk. The slot machines, narcotics, and brothels it bred. Everybody talked about Scarface Al. The working press wrote some courageous pieces about him, and the Dutch Schultzes and the others, but nobody knew what to do about them. And besides, these were the Roaring Twenties, and it was more important to know what Consolidated Can closed at, and would Shipwreck Kelly break the flagpole sitting record. Uh, what you doing, Andy? Uh, hello to Amos. Just checking my bank account, you. Yeah. Six million, eight million, twelve million. Hmm. Check and double check. Oh, 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 oh. There was Amos and Andy, and there was a husky voice from Spokane with considerable promise. Oh, please lend your little ear to my plea. Lend a ray of cheer to my plea. Tell me that you love me too. And a handsome young man from Maine who had already arrived. My time is your time. Your time is my time. I hope everybody. This is Rudy Valley. And the great Ziegfeld with Rio Rita, Showboat, and two other hits on Broadway at one time. And F. Scott Fitzgerald, Henry L. Mencken, the Ku Klux Klan, Hemingway, George Bellows, and Amy Semple McPherson. Sister Amy McPherson baptized her 100,000 out here every Sunday. Of course, it's the same 100,000 she uses every Sunday, but that's not bad. Bad baptizing, is it? <laughs> that's baptizing. She's got a ducking machine here where you duck 50 at a time. But the big question of 1927 was whether Silent Cal would take another whack at the presidency. I do not choose to run for president in 1928. Sanders, please have 25 copies of that made for the press. There are those in the Republican Party who will tell you that Coolidge wanted the 1928 nomination and launched his trial balloon to precipitate a draft. If such was the case, the stampede to Hoover must have broken his heart. Hoover made his race on the prosperity ticket. Two chickens in every pot. Given a chance to go forward with the policies of the last eight years, we shall soon, with the help of God, be in sight of the day when poverty will be banished from this nation. At the Democratic Convention in Houston, Franklin D. Roosevelt nominated his old friend, the governor of New York. We offer one who has the will to win who not only deserves success, but commands it. Victory is his habit. The happy warrior, 
Alfred E. Smith. Al Smith was a product of New York's East Side. He had risen from the Fulton Street fish market to be borough sheriff, and for four highly successful terms, governor of New York. His campaign for the presidency was dynamic, colorful, and was fought against enormous odds. Now let's look at the record. Prohibition has found a new line of endeavor for the underworld. They brought life to the bootleggers, and the bootleggers begot the hijackers, and the hijackers begot the racketeers. My friends of the radio audience, the only cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. So powerful were the sentiments against the wet Catholic Smith that Hoover, who personally hated such intolerance, was actually able to break the solid South. His victory was overwhelming. The Brown Derby even lost New York. American can, 181, 7 eighths. AT&T, 335, 5 eighths. Copper, 162. New York Central. It was 1929, Radio the year of the golden glow, of the boom, of the bull market, when a nation with a rainbow around its cocky shoulder stumbled onto what appeared to be the permanent plateau of prosperity. The capital was still in Washington, but the nation's pulse was to be felt where two swollen arteries named Broad and Wall Streets met. There, the stock market reflected a nation's fever. Everyone played the market. The financial page was read by more people than the sports page. Your barber and your cab driver talked about the kill their cousin had made in copper. And everybody talked about margin. At 10 o'clock on the morning of October 24th, the traditional bell sounded across the exchange, and another day of trading got underway. General Electric, 315. General Electric, 310. But by General 11 o'clock, Electric, it was apparent that this was no ordinary day. This was to be Black Thursday. And for a number of well-known stocks, no buyers could be found at any price. A constricting ripple of fear spread over the startled floor and to every corner of the nation. Margin. You'll have to put up more margin. Few of the millions of people who were playing the market owned their stocks outright. Most of it was on margin. And to do this, more than $6 billion had been borrowed from banks and brokers who would be forced to call if panic seized the market. Margin. Must have more margin. Still, there were no takers as values continued to fall. Then, at about 1.15, a hypodermic of adrenaline was given to the frightened patient. Richard Whitney, representing four of the big banking houses, walked onto the exchange floor and put in a bid for steel. Its price at the moment was 193. We'll buy steel at 205. 25,000 shares. The effect of the stimulant was immediate. A miracle seemed to have taken place. There were buyers for all stocks and the market rallied. And the case of national jitters quickly subsided. Nothing to worry about, just a freak run. How about those new debentures? Uh... But on the following Tuesday, October 29th, the bottom fell out of the market. No buyers were to be found for anything. American can, 120. It had been at 181. It fell to 86. at and 205. It eventually went to 197. Had been 304. Union Carbide, 73. In September, 137. In November... Union Carbide, 59. In that one fateful day, 16 million shares had changed hands. In a day which saw the ticker tapes running hours behind. In a day which left the mighty national shrine a bedlam of horror. Its vast floor strewn with 10 inches of paper. Its machinery buckling under the strain. Its operators exhausted in the growing pandemonium. And its customers, for the most part, cleaned out. The big bull market was dead. The golden glow of prosperity had turned to dross. But the disease was by no means localized. The toxic germs of despair were pumped to every part of the body. 
the arteries of commerce were clogged with 5,000 bank failures. 45,000 miles of railroads fell into bankruptcy. Big business that didn't fail retrenched and contracted, and the disease raced on to the capillaries in the cells. 12 million unemployed. More than half a million farms lost as farm prices fell 75%. 1930 brought the droughts to the eroded plains. 1931 brought the bread lines and the soup kitchens and the apple cellars and more unemployment. 15 million now. In 1932, federal troops were forced to fire on the bonus marchers who had encamped in Washington. Defiant farmers stood in line with shotguns to fight off tax foreclosures. The citizens of the richest nation in the world watched its lifeblood turning to water, unable to digest the produce of its burgeoning storehouse. This, indeed, was total depression. This is Robert Trout at our election headquarters in the newsroom in New York. The results of the 1932 election now appear to be certain. The ticket of Roosevelt and Garner has won a clear-cut majority over the Republican ticket of Hoover and Curtis. And so the United States has a new president. He will not take office, of course, until next March the 4th, when on the steps of the Capitol, Chief Justice Hughes will administer the oath to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. President Hoover, Mr. Chief Justice, my friend, this is a day of national consecration. And I am certain that on this day, my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impels. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is 